My name is Sheena Jocelyn and I'm a senior scientist at SickKids. Our lab is interested in understanding how the brain encodes and stores information. Now it's generally agreed that collections or ensembles of neurons serve as a physical representation of memory in the brain, the memory trace, or as Carl Lashley called it, the engram. However, understanding and finding the actual neurons or cells that encode any one memory has been challenging scientists since Lashley's search for the famous engram. We were inspired by Lashley's famous search and began our own search for a memory trace. However, unlike Lashley, who searched for a spatial maze memory, we use Pavlovian fear or threat conditioning. The reason why we chose this type of memory in our search for the engram was because previous research by many different groups showed that the amygdala, in particular the lateral nucleus of the amygdala, is key for this type of threat or fear learning. So this gave us a good place to look for the memory trace. Interestingly, evidence from electrophysiological and cellular imaging studies show that only a portion of LA neurons are involved in any one given memory. While several labs have shown that roughly 70% of LA neurons receive the necessary sensory input in that they respond both to the tone and the shock and therefore correctly wired to become part of a memory trace, only about 25% of these neurons exhibit auditory fear conditioning induced plasticity or become part of the memory trace. We wondered why this one neuron, rather than its neighbor, becomes recruited or allocated to the memory trace. We previously used replication defect of herpes simplex viral vectors to overexpress the transcription factor CREB in a small portion of LA neurons. HSV infects pyramidal or principal neurons in the LA. We showed that neurons with relatively higher levels of CREB were selectively recruited into a fear memory trace. That is, neurons with increased levels of CREB seem to outcompete their neighbors for allocation to a memory trace. And these neurons are necessary for subsequent expression of that memory. Now, CREB is a ubiquitous transcription factor implicated in many diverse cellular processes, including proliferation, survival, apoptosis, differentiation, metabolism, glucose homeostasis, and neuronal excitability. We wondered what aspect of CREB function was important in neuronal allocation during memory formation. One plausible mechanism is that neurons with high levels of CREB are preferentially recruited to a memory trace because these neurons are more excitable than their neighbors and a postsynaptic neuron that is more excitable than its neighbor would be primed for allocation into a memory trace. Here we use several methods to increase neuronal excitability and examine their effects on memory formation and neuronal allocation to the memory trace. Neuronal excitability is determined by the composition and distribution properties of ion channels in the plasma membrane. Increasing Krebs function increases neuronal excitability in part by decreasing voltage-gated potassium currents. Therefore, as our first method to increase excitability without directly manipulating Krebs function, we used HSV vectors to express a dominant negative KCNQ2. To decrease excitability without directly decreasing Krebs function, we used HSV to express KR2.1, an inwardly rectifying potassium channel, which decreases evoked action potential firing. We found that the memory enhancing effects of increasing CREP levels in a small portion of LA neurons are mimicked by dominant negative KCNQ2 to increase excitability and blocked by co-expression of KAR2.1 to counteract the increased excitability produced by CREP. We next assess whether these neurons with increased excitability at the time of training are preferentially recruited or allocated to a memory trace. As a second way to increase excitability, we turn to genetically encoded modulators of neuroexcitability to transiently increase excitability in a small portion of LA neurons. We use DREDs, or designer receptors exclusively activated by designer drugs. Specifically, we use HM3D constructs developed by Brian Roth's lab. The HM3D receptor does not respond to the endogenous ligand, but instead upon binding of CNO. A synthetic ligand with no natural behavioral effect increases excitability. Therefore, in this experiment, we use HSV to express HM3D dread and gave mice a systemic injection of CNO to transiently increase excitability only in those infected neurons in the minutes before training. Mice were tested 24 hours later without injection of CNO. We found that increasing a small portion of the LA pyramidal cells in the minutes before training was sufficient to enhance memory. Interestingly, systemically administering CNO immediately after training did not enhance memory, suggesting that the time before training was crucial for this effect.
how do we know that these neurons are actually part of the memory trace? Well, we use CNO to synthetically activate just these neurons prior to a memory test. Synthetic activation of neurons allocated to a memory trace, those with increased excitability prior to training, we found served as a sufficient cue for memory retrieval. Finally, we used optogenetic mediators of neuronal excitability to transiently increase excitability in a small portion of LA neurons immediately before training. We found this enhanced memory formation. Together, these experiments indicate that memory allocation is at least partially based on relative neuronal excitability at the time of training. Now, although Adelaide and I got to talk to you today about this interesting work, we'd also like to um, acknowledge the important contributions by our collaborators. It really does take a village. We like to acknowledge Valentina as well as Melanie Woodham's lab. And also, of course, our funding agencies without whom this work would not have been possible. So again, thanks and see you later from SickKids.